Hello and welcome to Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast exploring sound and image cultures. For our 10th episode, we're delighted to be joined by linguist Jeff Poole, discussing with Andrew and me his favourite film, Orson Welles' F for Fake. Many thanks to everyone who's been retweeting, sharing, pledging and supporting the podcast in all the ways. All the things that you're doing are really helping to get it off the ground. I'll be back after the chat with more information, but it's a fairly long one, so we're going to get stuck straight in. Hope you enjoy it and hope it's useful. Jeff, if you would like to just tell us who you are. Yeah, I'm Jeff Poole. I guess my Twitter bio says that I'm a soi disant lecturer in the philosophy of linguistics at Newcastle University in the School of English. And I guess that's about as accurate as anything, really. (laughs) I'm kind of not here in any professional capacity with respect to film or the teaching of film, just as an unbelievably huge fan Mm -hmm. uh, of this film. Well, that's all highly relevant to the nature of the podcast and the nature of which is it's very broad and borderless and messy. So I'm really keen to talk to people who are fans of something in particular and anything broadly or vaguely to do with audio and or visual cultures and of course linguistics is very much part of that. Probably when we're talking about F for fake we might want to get into linguistics but also film language, Mm -hmm. how these might marry up and if you're from a philosophical background well is there a way to marry that with film philosophy and the ontology of truth and lies and fakeness and all those sorts of things so there's quite a number of areas we can get into yeah i should say that's where i guess the soi disant comes in (laughs) insofar as my actual background is in formal linguistic theory in Mm -hmm. syntactic theory but i've always been really interested in that intersection of the philosophy of language philosophy of mind philosophy of science Mm -hmm. and that's actually what i've been teaching pretty much for the last five or six years in in particular i haven't taught syntax in a long time so i should say that i'm not a professional philosopher in that sense is anyone well (laughs) what does that even mean (laughs) i I suppose (laughs) At least I don't have a piece of paper that says that I know something necessarily about philosophy. Well, you've got a PhD, haven't you? Well, I do, I suppose. We're all doctors of philosophy (laughs) here. (laughs) Just like the scarecrow, you know, I don't have a brain, but I do have a diploma. We're watching F for Fake because we had a bit of a Twitter chat and you yeah. got an image of Orson Miles from the film yeah. as your Twitter profile picture. What is it about the film that really grabs your interest? I think it's the kind of, I suppose, maybe not surprisingly, it's the subject matter and the approach in that it actually reminds me, not to start off on too highbrow a plane, it actually reminds me very much of the dialogues of Plato in that it wants to raise philosophical issues, but it does that not by having a treatise saying, okay, uh, here, I'm Plato, I want to tell you about what justice is, here, now let me explain it to you. It's actually using the idea of a dialogue to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really interesting about this film is the way in which Orson Welles is taking his particular medium, which is film, and some of his particular interests actually around editing Mm -hmm. in particular, and using that to create a thing which addresses Addresses, even if it doesn't come to any firm conclusions, which again, most of the dialogues of Plato don't, it gives you a view on this particular philosophical issue. And I love the fact that it does that. Mm-hmm. And I love the way it does it too. The whole film, you have Orson Welles with that kind of twinkle in his mm-hmm. eye very much the whole time. Again, that's another possibly underappreciated feature of the Platonic dialogues as well, the way in which a lot of times Socrates is both joking and being serious Mm -hmm. at exactly the same, at one and the same sort of moment. And I feel like this captures that a lot. So as I say, I think that's really the reason that that I find it interesting. I guess also I've also been really interested, you know, one of the only times in my life when I was doing anything that you might call a kind of art project. Uh, This is like naturally when I was not writing my PhD. (laughs) stalling and avoid doing anything except (laughs) writing my PhD. I was really interested in doing audio collage, very influenced by people in the States and in Canada like John Oswald and like Negative Land. Negative Land in particular who very much do not just tell stories but they have projects that have a narrative that's entirely made up of collaged audio samples.
examples of various kinds. And so I think, too, there's that element as well that I recognize in terms of my own interests. Like, oh, yeah, right, he's doing the same thing, but just visually, though in a largely audio way. That is to say, you know, when he's cutting and pasting the particular images to create some of these counterpoints and whatnot, it's not really the visuals that he's interested in. It's the particular audio. So much of it's carried by his voiceover. Yeah. He's wonderful to listen That's to. I can listen to Orson voice. Welles read the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> it's just lovely to sit there and let him kind of wash uh-huh. over you. Oh, it's fantastic. I was wondering about his voice in particular and your expertise as a linguist, mm-hmm. what you make of his voice in general. It's kind of hard to know. I mean, in certain respects, to the extent that I have any professional reaction to that, it's a reaction of, I'm not actually really quite sure, and I'm happy to leave it to, in some sense, well ironic in this context, the experts, but in the sense of, (laughs) it's a point that Chomsky always makes about the kind of role of linguistic theory and what its role perhaps at this point in time is with respect to other wider issues about communication and whatnot. So it makes the analogy to theoretical physics and says, okay, well, it's true that, for example, the reason why a bridge stands up and doesn't fall down, sure, on some level that is ultimately rooted in the elements of subatomic physics and quarks, but it might actually not be the most helpful way to talk about bridges, talking about it at that level. And indeed, if you want to get a bridge that is not going to fall down, probably a theoretical physicist is not who you want to talk to. You want to find a bridge builder because they are the people that have the expertise with the thing at that particular level. Maybe it's just intellectual cowardice some of syntactic theory is just hard enough. It's like I don't even want to think about the hard of the questions about that are beyond that that look even more difficult. Mm. But I think from a professional point of view, if he, as he did, was super, super famous for his voiceover work and just so many people react to him in that way, there's clearly something going on. And I think clearly that ultimately is rooted in something to do with language and his use. And again, I, especially not being a phonologist or a phonetician, I'm not sure what that is. I suppose I shouldn't say we don't know because I don't know that we don't know. I I would want to consult colleagues. There is just something incredibly pleasing about the combination of words that he Mm, seems to effortlessly create and then the way he says them, you're hanging on every word no matter what he's talking about. I think that's true. I mean, indefinitely, the story that he tells about being a teenager in Ireland, which, as far Mm. as I know, is true in that it's Mm -hmm. part of his biographies. You can very easily see if he was anything even remotely like he is in the film, how the stage would be natural place for him to be. He has that gift, you know, as you say, of making everything sound stagey and thought through when that isn't necessarily the case. And everything's a performance, even when he maybe is telling the truth, you get this hint that he might not be, (laughs) because it's all performed. And the fact that it's all ADR'd as well. Yes. To add to that free sum of contrivance. And at some points, he's done it very well. The only thing that indicates that that's not the production audio is that it's just too clear and crisp, Mm -hmm. and seems to be spoken inside a studio. Whereas at other moments, it just doesn't match his lips. Mm -hmm. But I like that obviousness of the editing. It's very reflexive, so it looks like it's badly done, but it's deliberately badly done because we know from a very young age he knows exactly how to put a film together. And his earliest films are lauded as the best films of all time. Kane and The Magnificent Ambersons, his first two films, are masterpieces. He knows what he's doing. He knows that he's scuffing it. He's able to tell, that's my work, those are my fingerprints on that work. And that's, part of I think, part of the fun aspect of it as well, that in the context of magic tricks illusion and misdirection which is obviously again from the kind of initial introduction at the end a major element to this. What I like very much is precisely the fact that you do appear to see the things like the edits that aren't quite right and the bits that are very clearly shot in a studio when he's supposedly across the street from you know the desert in Nevada. But the way in which that's actually just more misdirection makes me think of stuff like Darren Brown where he talks about the various elements of his work being you know kind of whatever it is like He's got his pattern, I forget what it is, but psychology, sleight of hand, showmanship, psychology, whatever. And then he will occasionally give what appear to be explanations. Mm -hmm. But in fact, those aren't explanations. Mm -hmm. Those are just more misdirection. So he will make reference to psychological theories or suggest that something akin to neuro-linguistic programming, which is a complete BS, 
yes, is behind it. He'll sort of suggest mm. that. But again, let's say it's more mm -hmm. misdirection. And that's what I think is interesting about these, the way in which you see the editing room, you see these things that look sloppy, but you see nothing that he doesn't want you to see. It's interesting on that. David Thompson's biography of Wells, he talks about, well, you can do all this research, you can get all the facts about somebody's life, but you still need to tell a story. And then actually thinking back to when I'd read Charlie Chaplin's autobiography, and you compare that with the many, many, many biographies written about him, how much he's embellished, because he's trying to tell a good story, he's a storyteller, mm. he's telling you something that's a little bit truth, and it's a little bit fantasy, it's made up, because he's trying to grip you with a story and put beautiful words together. There's quite a lot of that going on in Fake as well. Here we are doing very podcasty noting. Yes, I know, that's like, you have, have to remember people can't see it. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to point out that there's quite a different range of awareness in the room going into watching this film because I hadn't seen it before. Paula, you'd seen it. I'd seen it uh, once before a few years ago. And Jeff watches it every day. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it at least ten times. You know, it was one of the first DVDs that I bought when I finally got a DVD player. You know, was the American Criterion F for Fake release. The undergraduate degree that I did was crewed by people who were sticking films like this all over it. It wasn't a film degree; it was a cultural studies degree mostly literature but the people were into showing us stuff that was really postmodern and was quite alienating so I'm surprised that this didn't at some point crop up maybe because it's not alienating <laughs> actually you know it, it's actually you know in that sense it's really yeah. it is it, it's postmodern in that way but precisely I think mm -hmm. doesn't and again not being a literature person I know very little about that but again it doesn't have that slightly distancing very kind of theoretical dimension to it that sometimes people I think bounce off of a little mm -hmm. bit especially students I did a film degree and never came across it in those studies either. I think partly looking back because I did documentary modules and I did avant-garde modules and there's a lot of crossovers between these two and I ended up teaching these at the same time. I ended up teaching modernism and documentary at the same time. There's a huge amount of crossovers but this somehow even falls between... It's both things at the same time but it's not documentary enough and it's not avant-garde enough. It's not pushing you away enough it's engaging you too much to be high art <laughs> Ironically, I think that's where the twinkle in his eye comes in again because he knows what he's doing. You feel like he made his masterpieces so young and very quickly was pissing off the studios that were hiring him. He wouldn't play ball. He was already breaking all the rules and he never ever played the game. You get the sense that he could have if he'd wanted to. He could have reined himself in if he'd wanted to but I just wonder, you get the sense that he loved the chaos he thrived off his own chaos and his films have so much order to them. I mean, this film is tight. It's a tight 85 minutes. There's no baggage in it at all. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's economical in the editing. He could have spun a yarn that was two hours long, but he doesn't. There's a lot going on. I mean, these couple of decades, the 60s and 70s, where he's promised all this money to people and he's run off and he's got all these partial made projects and he can't get anything finished and he's got this messy private life that's not really that private <laughs> and he's sort of a walking disaster area and yet he's so together and organized in the creation of his art he's still a conundrum I think he doesn't fit even the categories that already defy categorization he refuses to go into any boxes it's an overlooked film in many ways just some basics on what we've watched this is his last finished project I'm just looking up the details of some of the other people involved so it's about Elmer de was it de Hori? de Hori, I think it is yeah he killed himself two years after this film came out because the Spanish authorities had decided to hand him over to the French authorities there's the playful, I lie to everyone, I do what I want with these paintings and there's no negative consequences. That has a kind of underbelly, which mm. is that it did have negative consequences, including that the police they in France were after him. And, you know, perhaps in killing himself to try and avoid them, he was completely overreacting. 
Maybe, but you become the author of the self. You become self-defining. I think the film deals with this in a way. He's got this legacy, but it's all these other names that he's attached to. He's been all these other people, and maybe that's the one self-defining thing, his last hurrah as himself that he can do. I don't know. And you do get a little bit of a window into that part of it, because there are the bits towards the end of the Dahori section where it actually it isn't kind of all sweetness and light and the dinner parties you know, mm-hmm. where he's talking about having spent a month in prison in Ibiza and is clearly trying to put a good face on it. So, oh, these people came to see me and the judge, the judge, he, he said I was a good person. But there's clearly there, I think, an undercurrent of some of the implications for himself personally in terms of what he's done. Again, it is performance. It's all what's on the surface and what's going on underneath is very different. Also in David Thompson's biography of Wells, didn't go into any details, but he was saying that not long after this film, Franco's dictatorship ends, and Orson Welles has spent quite a bit of time in Spain, hasn't he? Has he been yeah. living there? Or? No, he lived in France, I think, oh. when he lived in Europe, but he always had a very strong affinity for Spain that comes through the Hemingway references. He apparently was a fan of bullfighting, which is mm. a little bit disappointing. And he did as well, if I remember rightly, one of his TV projects was a travel log type series that did regions of Spain and maybe in the 50s I always get it time-wise confused with another thing which maybe is one of the only places to look for antecedents for this or at least obvious antecedents is the Orson Welles sketchbook the okay. series of things that he did for the BBC oh yes where he would be drawing and uh, telling various kinds of stories that would relate to the drawing mm-hmm. that he was doing and illustrating various characters and mm-hmm. stuff like that he felt of a great affinity for uh-huh. Spain and did spend a lot of time there yeah. and he did live in Madrid do I want to say he lived outside Madrid for a period as well I, I don't know, I, one should look these things up. Yeah. He's but, living in France when he made this film, if I remember. Uh-huh. I think not long after that, the book doesn't go into any real details, certainly not in the bit I reread today, and I can't remember it because I read it years ago. But he ends up moving back to the US in the mid 70s yeah. or so. Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. Because Europe is shifting ground in a way, so the conditions aren't ready for him anymore, so he goes back and he never completes the film again. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, he, some of it wasn't his fault in the sense that at least one major project, which was The Deep, actually his leading actor died mm. in 1973. That was one of the projects that he was working on in the late 60s. And in fact, actually, that lead actor appears in Effort Fake. He's the person in the airport, train station, whatever it is exactly, when they put Oya Kodar, you know, they make her disappear and put her in the suitcase. Oh. Um, he's the person at the beginning. I think Wells actually says, yeah, so this is Lawrence, somebody or other, um, who I've been working with on other projects. Some of it certainly was appalling luck in that sense. Mm -hmm. But I think some of it is, as he does, sort of gets slightly caught up in the paying the bills in a slightly different way. So instead Mm -hmm. of acting in these various European eight-way co-productions, he starts doing, you know, very famously his wine commercials and Mm -hmm. stuff like that, which is the way that I, growing up in the 70s in America, that's my first memory of Orson Welles Mm -hmm. are the wine commercials that he was doing um, and also the Muppet movie of course because he, oh, yes. he has a cameo in the Muppet movie uh-huh. which is wonderful <laughs> and I think he did voiceovers on quite a lot of cartoons yeah that's right so I grew up hearing his voice quite a bit and then when I got older and I realised who he was I thought oh right that must have been somebody who sounded like him sort of doing like an Orson Welles yeah. parody no it was actually him <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just looking on the extensive Wikipedia page for Orson Welles just to see about where he was when he died and he was back in the States yeah it's like someone just transcribed all of the David Thompson biography onto that one Wikipedia page which I suppose is it's not entirely did. possible really <laughs> Oh, and about Oya Koda, Mm. more on the subject of contrivance. She was, it seems, his partner at the time, although he was still married married, to his third wife. So it was seemingly an ongoing affair. The name Oya Koda was a name that Wells gave to her. Yeah, that's a yeah, right. stage name. Which and is funny because right at the very end, even as he's saying, hey, you know, right at the end when there's sort of, I guess, it's spoilers, but people will know that. You know, he says, oh, hey, by the way, remember that promise that I was going to tell the truth for an hour? Well, that hour ended 17 minutes ago and this all <laughs> been a lot. Even then, he actually makes his point of saying, Oya Koda, that's her real name. When it's not. When, yeah. Right. Okay. Yes. When, when it isn't. <laughs> Sorry, although I guess then that gets us into a separate conversation, which we can have. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, about what is reality, right? Yeah. If that's effectively her stage name, has that become her real name in the way that... Mm-hmm. that when I was thinking about that earlier, I was that it made me think of the problems that uh, Michael Caine... Pretty sure it was Michael Caine, was it not? Who, event, like, literally a year ago, had to legally change his name because he never changed it from his original name and was just getting such a hassle at airport security in this oh. day and age. That you know, people right. go, no, but I no, you're not this guy. You're Michael Caine. No, no, I've seen you in movies. So, no, 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 stage name people. No, really, this is my. No, no, but you're Michael Caine, and he eventually, I think, in like the last year, maybe did that. But sorry, I Andrew, didn't, I didn't come to... across that. Actually, it's mm-hmm. fascinating. Well, we were doing a discussion which hasn't podcasted yet, but will at some point. Well, it is now about Max Linder. It was born Gabriel Maximilien Lavoyel and adopted the name Max Linder when trying to make his name on the Paris stage in about 1904. His daughter was raised as Maud Linder, so his name effectively became Max yeah. Linder just before he and his then wife had kids. If it's the name you use in all dealings, even if it's not on your birth certificate, it is, practically speaking, your name. I have to admit, on postmodernism, I've been thinking about postmodernism a lot recently because people keep talking about how we live in a post-truth society. And I think, ah, the fact that people are now claiming this is actually evidence that we live in a post-post-truth society. Because people are able to go, we're being lied to all over the shop and that's a bad thing. Whereas postmodernism, that was post-truth in the sense of everything's a lie and it doesn't really matter. There's evidence recently that we've come out the other side of postmodernism modernism has started to realise that there is such a thing as verifiable truth and that there may have been some abuses that were facilitated by the idea that everything's just an invention that we come up with second by second. Looking at this from 1973, I just wrote down this is pure postmodernism. I think it was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, about 14 different regards in which this is really postmodern. And the first way was the constant talking. Genre-wise, website after website disagrees over what it is, some call it a docudrama, some call it a documentary essay. I can see why because it has elements of that standard voiceover of an authoritative narrator explaining circumstances to you but then that voiceover hands over to the characters involved, characters being interviewed and then they in answering a question by an interviewer they then voice over footage of themselves at a party or themselves interacting with their pet monkey. Mm. And we all love Clifford Irving's pet monkey. That's the star of the film. (laughs) Really? I think it was a little macaque. Uh, and they actually do interact, sorry to interrupt, they do interact a little bit at various points, which I also love, where um, Orson Welles will actually, when there's a pause and the person is like trying to think of what to say, there are a couple places where Welles, as a voiceover, says the word, and then the person on film produces the know, I'm, you know, and this is very kind of, I don't know, and then Orson Welles, predictable. Right? <laughs> <laughs> predictable. <laughs> I love that, mm. again, that playing with it. So aspect number one of this film for me was to have a constant avalanche of people talking. And that characterised the hour which was, so to speak, genuine. It was only during the 17 minutes after that hour, which was that invented thing about Picasso, where there were actually any significant periods of people not talking. The vast majority of that hour was constant talking. And it's, it's exhausting, because we're used to watching films where, even if it is a documentary, there's pauses for the opportunity just to watch something, there's pauses to take in what we've just been told. But that was, no, you're just going to be immersed in language. That language is going to be a game with its own rules that doesn't refer to anything in the outside world. It's going to be a kind of pure matter of internality rather than reference. And I suppose, of course, the fact that it's entirely about questioning the idea of authenticity in art is a big postmodern thing as well. Although on that, I found myself thinking, does this question the idea of authenticity in art, or does it just specifically question one view of what art should be that's very specific to the early 20th century, which is that it's a great man thing, that if something's a really good piece of work, and it's by Joe Nobody, then it's worth nothing, and if, but if something's exactly the same, but it's by Or a squiggle? Mod, yeah, it's <laughs> mm. worse, and it's by Modigliani then it's worth 15, mm. 20 thousand pounds See, I think the point is made quite late on in the film that it's down to the art market it's not about value as cultural objects, it's actually down to monetary value that's been built by the art market it's the name that has mm. currency and Wells is playing in that very much because his name has currency so it's, it's an implicit criticism of the f- art markets having turned the names of specific people into brands which are supposedly guarantors of quality when they're not yeah it's one of those things I suppose where it's a criticism and it's a celebration of it at the same time because mm. again he's cashed in on that it's a chink that Elmer the Hori is 
has been able to live off. The film industry bears many similarities to that playing of the art market. Names are sellable. Films are marketed by the star director or the star producer or the star actors. So it's all about marketability and what's attached to a name. So the fact that a forger who could actually create totally brand new paintings, even not even copies, but just something in the style of this person because he knows how to do a Picasso, he knows how to do a Mame or a Mame or whoever it is and be able to sell it to a gallery with them thinking that it's real. That's how to play the market. It's the talent for creating art. It's the simulacrum, isn't it? Baudrillard? The simulacrum is the simulation which is there to persuade you that the rest of the world is real. So a hoax. Has no forgery. original. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it's especially with that story of the 22 paintings of Oya Godar, the end of the story is that, oh, you can't have the originals because we burned them. So it's the mm-hmm. fakes that have no original. The piece of dialogue that was put into the mouth of Oya Godar's completely invented grandfather was quite revealing where he said, please tell me I've been able to give something new to the world an entire new Picasso period yeah. so I was able to invent something authentic about the Picasso brand that people didn't know about please let me have that there's a text in here about forgers as actually creating something new although why the forgers don't just paint their own paintings I suppose in the light of that it's because of the rush involved in doing something which is taboo and in some yeah. cases illegal in the film at least they mention he tried to but he didn't have the imagination yeah that there's copy. this person has no particular unique worldview mm-hmm. and therefore has nothing to say yeah. which is their own but clearly is able to through the vehicle of other people's styles or whatever mm-hmm. create things that are similar enough to be taken to be almost not even just sellable although that's obviously a large component of it but that even the larger kind of aesthetic mm-hmm. question if Elmir Dahori can produce a Matisse which is as aesthetically valuable and beautiful as an original Matisse and for the same reasons Mm -hmm. then what actually is the difference Mm -hmm. between the two it was fascinating that part where he was performing painting the Matisse and he's explaining that Matisse didn't have the confidence to follow the lines through so I have had to pause I've had to stop I've had to jerk you know that kind of thing and he actually performs in the air how to do a Matisse line that performance that embodying of these other artists is really fascinating and then was Orson Welles there who is someone who is an actor has always been an actor even as a con man or whatever he's always acting he's always performing he is someone who has made a living of pretending to be other people so what's the difference between them they collapse into one another the film also wanted to add in quite a few categories of covertly pretending to do something because there was art forgery and then there was also the Clifford Irving hoax about Howard Hughes the word hoax was used quite a few times and Mm -hmm. it was on newspaper headlines and it was the name of a book that Irving himself wrote I think that was then adapted into a film later on about the whole Howard Hughes thing yeah it's the Richard Keir film I think 2006 if I remember rightly yeah called The Hoax Mm -hmm. which is the story of Clifford Irving's hoax with respect to the Howard Hughes biography so there's hoaxes and there's forgeries and then there's fakes and then there's Wells' own I'm just going to lie to you for 17 minutes of this film. And there's the copy and the collage and the replay. I mean, in a sense, some of our shots were replays of other shots. Yeah, there's Let's Watch That Again and it's replayed and very often you've got the shot playing or replaying on a TV screen that's within the frame. So there's many levels of mediation. And going it's quite on. overt because in quite a few mm-hmm. instances it's Orson Wells doing his narration, not as voiceover but as on-screen dialogue, him sitting behind an editing desk mm-hmm. surrounded by cans of film rather cartoonish looking cans of film all immaculately taped up as if he's editing the film that we're seeing at that point point. and there's a whole history of meta films where some of the footage is somebody editing the film that Man with the movie camera yeah. yeah that was actually one of the things I was hoping to learn from people who actually know about <laughs> these sorts of things is to what extent what are the antecedents if anything for F for fake and even what sorts of things in a more modern sense might be comparable 
vulnerable. And even just trying for me to think about what are the sorts of things that could possibly fall into this category. There are certainly documentaries that are very centered on the documentarian. Things like Michael Moore, Roger and Me, or uh, Morgan Spurlock, Super Size Me, that sort of thing. And even going back, I was also thinking about things like Michael Palin's Around the World in 80 Days series, and I guess The Wicker's World, which preceded that, which I'd never seen, so I, I know it only because he refers to it in Around the World in 80 Days. But that seems clearly different from what's going on here, you know, this is not in any way about Wells and some kind of journey that he's on mm -hmm. as such. So it didn't seem like that and the only thing I could almost think of really were some things like maybe some of Michael Moore's later documentaries, the ones that are more documentary essay types, classically something like Bowling for Columbine, but again, knowing very little about either documentary films or avant-garde mm -hmm. films, and as I say, trying to think of what would have come before aside from generic fourth wall breaking, because of course that's the thing, I mean in a way this is like a very radical fourth wall breaking that's going on in this actually you know are there films that you could even say somehow might plausibly be connected to this that he's building on or would have known about or I would say so Wells was always very well clued up on what was going on in the 1920s and 1930s in France largely in Europe more generally but certainly in France a lot of the cinematography in Citizen Kane is attributed to him as the first ever to use deep focus but actually Jean Renoir was doing that 10 years before in France. In terms of fake documentary, there's a solid history of that in France. The surrealists were already doing it. Louis Bonuel, the Spanish director who was living mostly in France, his collaborations with Salvador Dali as well. But Bonuel made a film called Land Without Bread, and that's one of the earliest fake documentaries. So it was a documentary that was in the style of a travelogue, but it's completely fabricated. You've got things like this authoritative voiceover. And there were several versions, a Spanish version and a, an English language version and so on. So you've got that authoritative voice of God, you would call it, saying this little girl had this wrong with her. Three days later, she was dead. It's stuff like that going on, making a mockery of those types of films that were colonial, oh, her little foreigners mm -hmm. type things, because this is coming off the back of Robert Flaherty's Nanak of the North a few years after that and that sort of thing. So there's a history of that Jean Vigo, who was a young filmmaker in France and he died for very young so he only made four films but his earliest couple of films were highly experimental documentaries. His first ever film was A Propos Denise. There's no narration, it's a silent film with music but it's the editing is the narrator and it's making commentary on all of the rich bourgeois people in the south of France and what they have built on the backs of long traditions of African appropriation and slavery and that sort of thing and also how they're continuing to keep down the poor it's tapping into that long history of revolutionary politics in France most immediately those are springing out to me as early examples I would say he's probably well aware of those kinds of films because he knows what's going on in France and Spain I think in the 20s and 30s and 40s later on I was thinking about the essay film it's hard to know how to describe it because there's many descriptions and again it's a very messy form and it's documentary but it's not and it's avant-garde and it's not and it depends how you look at it so the likes of Agnes Varda's more recent documentaries The Gleaners and I around 2000 Patricio Guzman's films Nostalgia for the Light The Proud Button they would be described as essay films they're personal but they're bigger than that you've maybe got that one person carrying the film it's coming from a personal perspective but it's about a much bigger issue your way in with them and the topic is their journey through it I think the principle is summarised as the subject of the film is what it feels like to investigate an actual real world issue, not the real world issue. So there is indirect investigating the real world issue, but in the main it's our narrator character telling you about this obsession mm -hmm. that he or she has. And it's both, and it's like F for fake, it's the actual act of making the film is the investigation and is adding meaning to the issue and is possibly even used for activism in some way. It's probably worth looking into Chris Marker's body of work. And I suppose another set of antecedents would be Soviet montage as well. One of the things that predates the supposed discovery, in inverted commas, of the principle of what the Soviets usually meant by montage, so the principle that we call the Kuleshov effect, where two shots 
by being juxtaposed in time create an impression which is not evident in each shot on its own. It's an impression to do with the conflict of the two shots in time. Before that was even discovered, Lev Kudrasov's previous discovery, and discovery again in inverted commas because he may not have innovated it, but he claimed to have, was this principle that is known as either creative geography or virtual geography. And it's where a script where we have dialogue for two people, if Paula's one of the two people and you're the other one, we can shoot the dialogue so that Paula does her lines outside a building in the centre of Newcastle and Jeff does his lines outside a building in the centre of Sunderland as if you're talking to each mm -hmm. other face to face and then just through you editing we just them. cross cut between the two make sure the directions are all matched up and voila you've created a geography out of this mm -hmm. that doesn't exist in the real world and that happens in at least two points yes. in this yeah. film and probably more probably more but, yeah. yeah but definitely obviously in a couple of places I think you already mentioned the hotel in Las Vegas yeah that's that's yeah. very clear yeah. uh -huh. and yeah. the other one is the opening sequence with Boyer walking through the streets. His yes, Wells yeah. claiming that he got her to walk around and then all these men were turning their heads and therefore acting for free. But none of those shots included a person turning their head within the same shot mm -hmm. of Oya walking down the street. That stuff was all clearly intercut later. So maybe those men were turning around to look at Oya walking down the street, they but it wasn't those specific mm -hmm. shots yeah. that we were seeing there. And the other one was what seemed like a conversation between Irving and Dahori about whether Dahori signed the work, his fakes or not. Yeah. Because Irving was saying they were all signed, and Dahori was going, "No, I never signed any of them." It's just yeah. one of those instances where you go, "All right, one of the two of us is mistaken, and neither of us are going to admit it." So there's just this constant repetition by both of these characters. Yeah. They were all signed. I never signed any of them. They were all signed. I never signed any of them. And it goes back and forth several times, as if they're in the same room having that conversation, but they're actually part it's of two different, different interviews. Yeah. So Wells is into the creative powers of editing. That's clear for even in Citizen Kane, which of course is associated with not editing. There's masses of editing. Oh, loads. Creative editing. Absolutely. Editing. Including much in-camera editing and mm. in-camera montage. This is the work of somebody who is highly cine-literate. Because there's literacy in the sense of just having read a lot, you know, in inverted commas, and there's literacy in the sense mm. of being aware of the finer points of the, yeah. of the, of the, of the kind of code. Of theoretical and applied filmmaking. Yeah. 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 So both. coming together, yeah. And I don't know whether it was just that I had, by that point, fallen so far down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I was actually watching it, even wondering, in some of those sequences where it's apparent Clifford Irving being edited by the original mm -hmm. filmmaker Francois Reichenbach. Mm -hmm. When they're going back and forth, I'm looking at that wall and wait, that wall looks different. The film mm -hmm. stock looks different. I don't even think they're actually in the same room. And I don't know how much of that is appropriation because, of course, I don't think we've mentioned the origin of this in that there was originally that Francois Reichenbach was in the middle of it had an incomplete documentary about Elmer Dory and then meets Wells and Wells takes it over <laughs> and repurposes it in large measure. So it may even have been in that those shots were shot at different times or something like that. Maybe even with him repeating the questions that he had asked just because he had only one camera on the shoot when he was doing the interview and so has to do the Irving interviews and his responses separate. You do get this sense that there are times when you think this person knows that they're being filmed for a straight documentary. This isn't intended for what was going to become that film. I suppose while well, it's fresh in my mind after the montage of all the men looking, there's quite a lot of leeriness at Oya and yeah. this persona of hers and it's really the body, isn't it? And Wells is a well-known feminist, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a certain <laughs> unreconstructed dimension to some of this in terms of the sexual politics of it. Although, if I remember rightly, Oya Kodar claimed that bit, which is part of some other project, as Wells says, was actually that she imagined there being a feminist dimension to what she was doing. I've heard this expressed, and again, you know, I'm a kind of white American middle-aged man. I'm possibly the least oppressed person on the face of the earth, right? So I have no insight into this <laughs> issue in any way. I don't know whether at least one person, I guess, believes that or takes that view. Seemingly that somehow, as long as you're complicit in your exploitation, that that's mm -hmm. somehow okay. Yeah, I don't... It's difficult because I suppose it raises the question of who's the exploiter, yeah. because she seems to have been a very wealthy person. And from what I've been reading, she always kept her independence when she was involved with Wells. She always had her own house. She doubled her own money things. I think she didn't fall into the trap that many of the other people in his life fell into. And she didn't give him any of her yeah. money. Okay. <laughs> the thing that Coda might have been doing was what we've recently seen in the case of the 10 hours of walking in New York City as a woman film. Yes, yeah. Which is the, I'm just going to be mm -hmm. in public and there'll be a recording oh. of what it's like to be in public. It did make me think of things like that, yeah. Right. You know that one 
where it was done in, was it 2014? And it was the actress, Shoshana Roberts, who did it. She was heckled and... Well, I saw, she, oh, wow, she did yeah. all the street harassment, all the usual the word, stuff. Yeah. Stalking as well. A guy Oof. followed her for ages. Yeah. If that was what that segment was for, it wasn't framed in such ways to indicate that that's what that mm. segment was for. It was just, you know, everybody stare at the yeah. pretty woman. The, what this segment was for was to go look at how lacking in control these men are. These men are all lectures. But this is what you do if you if you want to have a film which lectures at somebody and has some ability to persuade its viewers that it's okay for the film to also lech at its female participants, have a scene in which you fool some of the characters, which you ridicule some of the characters for doing the leching. That means that that act of ridiculing means that you're now immune to accusations of yourself leching, so you can now lech as much as you want. And that bit during the 17 minutes of made up story with Oya walking around the little village in wherever well, it's, it's called to be. Tucson. I think that place doesn't exist. Yeah. That's an entirely made up name. I'm sure there's a real village in the photographs that they show you, but I don't think that place even actually exists. It was supposed to be in France. Yeah, it's in the south of France, yeah. yeah. During that, she just becomes more and more naked. And I think that the when she's gamboling barefoot through the streets yeah. late in the day, wearing... The blue what, dress, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah, wearing a huge piece of blue, translucent Lovely fabric. colour blue, it yeah. must be said. <laughs> yeah. um, that was as close as you could get at this point, I suppose, to just showing somebody frontally completely naked. There was lots of other shots where she was completely naked, but from the back, or she was kind of hunched over so that she was covering everything. That was and if I remember the DVD commentary right, I think she does say, because she's on the, the Criterion commentary, that she is naked under that blue mass of whatever. It was kind of weird because, yeah, I'm trying to remember the story, and of course I won't remember it properly, but it was shot in one of the towns in France that's a little village that has a lot of pilgrims because mm-hmm. there's a spa or there's some reason, you know, a, a visitation of the Virgin Mary or something a hundred years ago. <laughs> and apparently they were like trying to do that shot while she's running down and there's like pilgrims going the other way to the oh. train station and she's like, the whole thing was completely <laughs> awkward. But it's interesting that they choose Picasso to do this with because of course what does he do to the female figure? <laughs> he abstracts it, he pulls it apart. It's not a likeness of her. So it's like the idea of this salacious painter being uh, with his naked woman. The story about Picasso, the reason, it seemed to me at least, why Wells came up with this particular story with these particular details, is that one of the things that seems to trouble him about the Dahori's phenomenon is that if you have this painting that's found in someone's attic and it's verified by all the experts as being a Kirchner and then another one turns up and it's also verified as being a Kirchner but the first one is real and the second one is Dahori's, there's no way of telling. There's this uncertainty which is really frustrating and it seems to be the thing which is driving Welch's obsession here. I think the reason he fantasizes this particular story with Picasso is because there's a way in which you can actually resolve it, is if the artist does happen to still be alive, you can haul them into a room and go, did you paint this? Please resolve this for us. So it was like a fantasy of actually being able to resolve questions about authenticity. Although I suppose he did also tell that painting about how even Picasso himself had said that some of his own paintings didn't count as genuine Picasso. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm capable of painting a, a bad Picasso, or a fake Picasso as well. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and that's interesting. I mean, and that, that gets back, I think, to one of the things that I think at the heart of it, Wells talks about at the very end with the levitation magic trick again, where he then finally does talk a little bit about himself as a charlatan and what that means. And getting back to the point you were making, Andrew, about what distinguishes these various types of forgeries and lies that are going on. Clearly, his claim from the end is that forgeries that are pointing at some kind of truth, telling a lie to reveal something true, that that's art and like that's okay and that somehow aiming at truth in some way or revealing truth in some way is supposed to be part of what's distinguishing these various classes of people doing various kinds of hoaxes and forgeries and stuff like that the ones that are charlatans which he takes to be a good thing the ones who are spinning lies in the service of some further truth are okay but perhaps not others it's telling of course that it starts off with Wells doing some conjuring tricks (laughs) to a little boy in a station because the classic thing with a stage conjurer is that the conjurer is not claiming to have magical powers the conjurer is just not telling you how they do their deceptions so it's an open lie the conjurer lies to you but isn't actually trying to deceive you it's the lie not intended to deceive and that's a phrase I borrowed from an early cinema historian called Joe Kemper who is great of course
Wars. And that seems to be a model that we're supposed to hold on to for the rest of the film and think, oh, okay, so forgery, art forgery, when there's massive amounts of money involved, still, it's a lie not intended to deceive, because it's a lie intended to do something else. Being very uncharitable to this film, we could simply say that it was an attempt to try to take several figures who had done something which falls within the category of deception and had done some harm by that and to try and redeem them in some way. And you could see why Wells himself would feel impelled to do that because he had, with the War of the Worlds, radio dramatization, accidentally accidentally on purpose or at least inadvertently persuaded a bunch of people that their country was being invaded by Martians and actually caused real harm to come to real people so perhaps he was trying to do something there to cleanse his own conscience from a lie that he had told which he wasn't aware was going to be believed maybe this is the cynical reading of this film maybe it's a cleansing of Wells' own conscience through taking things that are forgeries and hoaxes and saying aren't these things great rather than aren't they the activities of people who are borderline criminals Again, I suppose, if he was trying to do that, he wouldn't have overtly mentioned actual criminal acts by these people. And it was quite vague, but the mention of bank fraud... Basically what that's about, and they don't really... They obliquely refer to it, but they don't really explain what the deal is. My understanding is that what they're referring to is that when Clifford Irving got an advance from the publisher for the fake biography of Hughes, some of that money was supposed to go to Howard Hughes. But, of course, his plan was to take all of it. And that what he did was he managed to get the publisher to cut checks to H.R. Hughes. Right. And that what happened was his wife at the time who was in the film and I cannot now remember her name actually then got fake identity documents under the name of Helga R. Hughes and went and deposited the money in Swiss bank accounts and then withdrew it immediately. That's the bit where he's talking about who is this woman and the wig and are we ever going to hear about that? That's actually one of the things in a way weirdly enough that he sort of sets up but then never really explains but that that was the idea that there was something like three quarters of a million pounds advance on the fake autobiography at least some of which was due to go to Howard Hughes, which he then managed to get his wife to go to Switzerland and extract under false pretenses, which is obviously a very serious criminal act. I'm just reading about it here. Her name was Edith. Edith, yeah. Irving's wife. I was thinking on that a lot of the film is centred on narratives of failure in some way. So there's quite a lot of success to a point in being a faker. So even Orson Welles, when he goes on this spiel about himself and his own past, he's a failed artist, he's a failed painter, so he ends up becoming an actor and then a movie maker. And he even points out at one point that he's a failed waiter. Yes. He considers <laughs> becoming an actor as the cop-out when yeah. he could have gone and got a job working in a restaurant, which yeah. is quite funny. Because he succeeds in telling lies, believable lies. It starts him on this artistic career that's not what he wanted or envisaged. With Dore, he started out as a painter in his own right and fails at that, so he copies. There's all these narratives of failure underpinning everybody's motivations, everybody's actions. The big question is F for fake, but it's F for what else? Mm. That, too, is an interesting question that I've always wondered about. Well, there's two things about it. One is that, again, if you watch the actual film, it looks as if the title of the film is About Fakes, because <laughs> that's what appears on the can that you see, you know, About Fakes, filmed by Orson Welles or something like that, and then you get the various other credits. But it is certainly not in English known under that title. What is F for Fake supposed to signify? It's hard to know. There's all kinds of things. I suppose the one that I always just landed on is the sort of children's alphabet book thing, and that partly tying into the very, very very, very beginning of the film, trying to capture the childlike wonder of everything that he's trying to do, if you see what I mean. And, you know, connected up with the twinkle in his eye and everything. It's like, you you know, here, we're going to do sleight of hand, but it's going to be fun. You should approach it in that sort of spirit. The early mention that he made while doing that conjuring of Robert Houdin, it was at Robert Houdin's magic theatre in Paris that a young Georges Méliès got Mm -hmm. his training. Not just in simple hand conjuring, but also in the really elaborate devices you had to make in order to do stage illusions, which involved things like trapdoors and mirrors. And it was on the basis of that that he became the first and most prolific trick filmmaker. There was quite a controversy in the press on both sides of the English Channel, what's called La Manche in France, yes. about whether such films where, you know, for example, you did the stop trick and had someone jump off a table and turn into a clown when they hit the ground, you know, simple stop motion substitution no is this yeah stop motion substitution yeah whether that simple turning something into something else making something disappear multiple exposure whether that simple use of trick filmmaking ought to be called faking or whether it ought to have the title of trick where it's more esteeming of the 
practice behind it. It's more respectful. It's more, oh, that's a bit like conjuring. That nod to Arbe Rudin was implicitly a nod to a specific sort of very early filmmaking. One in which, again, it's a matter of deception, using the toolkit at your command, but not in order to deceive. I think that's the contract that Wells is trying to establish quite early in this film, mm -hmm. which is that there's going to be a deception. So I suppose that bit where at the end he goes, ha, ah, I did tell you. Yeah. I was only going to tell you the truth for an hour. I've never come across that before. We're talking about antecedents for this film, but that's one aspect that I'd never come across. Yeah. A simple statement that there's going to be a duration for which this film is going to have identity A, and then that's going to stop. And then I'll remind you at the end that there was two periods during this film. And that you've probably forgotten that there was a transition period at one point. <laughs> there's actually as well a kind of magic connection as well between Houdin and Wells. Indirectly, because of course, as I understand it, Harry Houdini took yeah. his stage name from Houdin. Yeah. And in fact, one of the sort of, again, Wellsian stories that I think appears in his biographies and things like that is a story that he told of being about the age that that child is in the, at the very beginning and meeting mm -hmm. Harry Houdini right. and being taught sleight of hand and stuff like that from Harry Houdini, which is what kicked off his personal lifelong enjoyment of and interest in sleight of hand and magic tricks and stuff like that. We know Houdini for escapology. Apparently Houdini was a bit crap at escapology. Mm -hmm. He'd managed to pull it off about half the time, but the rest of the time it would be a complete failure. Or he'd pull it off after 20 minutes, having claimed that he'd do it in one, mm -hmm. you yeah. know? So apparently he was a lot better at slight handling than he was at escapology. That beginning sequence is really, really interesting, and, and without obsessing too much about details, one of the things that always strikes me about that sequence is literally the first five seconds of the film, when he's setting up the kind of standard magic pattern, as if it's going to be a magic trick that he's going to show you, you know, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a small object. But what he says at the beginning I think is really interesting. He's, ladies and gentlemen, let me see, I think I actually had it written down. Yeah, so for my next experiment, yeah. I need a small object object or whatever. So he's using that the kind of frame of that pattern, but where you would normally expect somebody to say trick, you know, for my next trick I'm going to do blah 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 blah. He says experiment. And that's like literally the first words of the film, you know, for my next experiment I need blah blah blah. That always strikes me as such a strange thing to say, but presumably therefore significant in terms of, okay, so if this is an experiment, and it's even over black that, it's before even he gets to the boy, I'd take clearly be talking you know, about the project as a whole, kind of what he's yeah. trying to do in the way, and again, a, a very lovely sort of Plato way. You have an introduction where almost all of the themes of the actual dialogue are present in this little kind of introductory sequence, which is why you never, ever, ever skip introductions in Plato even when it just oh hi yeah hello oh, oh, down at the gym yeah that was interesting and when we saw this guy you know those are always like super important I've always been struck by that like so it's an experiment it's not a trick mm -hmm. apparently it's an experiment it's only when Oya says oh you're up to your old tricks again that the word trick even gets mentioned and maybe it's just something as simple as he doesn't want to tip his hand so early it does make me think okay right so what's the nature of this experiment who is being experimented on is it the viewer is it something like the the film going public, given all the trouble he had about films getting accepted and whatnot, is that the subject of the experiment? Is it going to be a commercial success? Are people going to understand what I'm trying to do? Mm -hmm. Or is something more intended? I would say it's that hubris being coded as modesty. This is the master filmmaker still experimenting yeah. like a little boy mm -hmm. at making films. Whether or not the film is a success commercially or critically, this is his opus. This is his final swan song. My, and he knows what he's was, doing. my thinking was that he was saying, I've spent years making films according to a rule book and sometimes tearing a few pages out of that rule book. But now I'm at the point where I'm, I'm now an experimental filmmaker. Mm -hmm. An experimental defined there as someone who doesn't work according to any aspect of an existing rule book. So it seemed to be a statement of non orthodoxy. As well as, I suppose, also, an experiment is a means to establish something that is true. And so that could imply that what he's after here is some deeper and inverted commas truth. I hate that term, deeper truth. Like this. There's only shallow truth, there's only counts truth. In fact, he's after some deeper truth in all of this discussion about fakery. There will be something amongst all of this mass of people lying to each other that will constitute some sort of research finding. Was anyone else just annoyed by the Hori after about two thirds of the way through and just how persistently he was lying? There was such an air of contrivance about everything that he said. It was the thing about when he got out of a night spent in the, well, not more than a few nights, I suppose, spent in the, in the jail. Yeah, I think, I think he says it's like a month that he spent in jail. Yeah. And then he throws a party and he's his old self very quickly at the party. He's greeting his guests and even at that party he's got a drink in his hand. And some mention, I think, at that party about 
about him having been in a concentration camp when he was younger. Uh, what is it? There's a myth about him that's even part of that story. All this stuff is kind of blurred together. The concentration camp thing, I think, was just that somebody who had met him and that he was from a, a perfectly normal kind of lower middle class background right. and not from an aristocratic background, which I guess he, it, yeah. he would have claimed. But yeah, you, you do wonder, and maybe it's more than just about Dahori. One has this reaction in all sorts of different contexts. How were they able to get away with it for so long? When it, there are all the things seem obvious in quotation. Marks. It's the confidence of the mediocre man. It's something I've never <laughs> been able to understand yeah. to tap into. We're all three of us being very generous via Orson Welles to somebody who committed what in an academic context would be academic misconduct. Mm. Right? Would be plagiarism. Yeah. And in our academic lives, we look extremely harshly on people who knowingly commit plagiarism. We take into account when people do it without knowing that it's a thing. But when it's clear that they know what it is and that they've done it anyway, that's the way to get yourself kicked out of a university. But I suppose the difference there is that there's an attempt to deceive in plagiarism. And the implication in F for Fake is that there is some playfulness some avoiding of an intent to deceive on Dory's part. And I suppose part of that comes through this claim that, well, he may sell his paintings to those who he knows. He sells them quite cheaply. And it's then the people who he knows that then sell them on for twice, three times the price and make huge sums off them. And there's also repeated shots of him burning the paintings and the drawings that he does as well as if mm -hmm. what Dory does is he just works out in a mental gym where he works on his Matisse style for a bit mm -hmm. and works on his Modigliani style for a bit but then never sells these things even though he clearly has there's a big asserting of something other than an intent to deceive going on here mm -hmm. in spite of the fact that it's so clearly iterated at so many points that Dory is constantly deceiving people by just constantly lying to them I think they get around it by is it Irving describes it as he'll take this painting that's a copy to one expert and they'll say yes that's absolutely an original I'll verify it and they'll buy it for the gallery that kind of thing mm -hmm. and they'll take the exact same copy to another person and they'll say well this is clearly a fake it's mocking the idea of the expert that was one of the things that I was thinking about, and this film kind of always does make me think about it, and in a way sort of connects up actually to the point that you were making about who you're fooling and whatnot, is the extent to which the critique of art experts either can be generalized or is supposed to be generalized. Again, it's got Plato on the brain, of course. It's that same thing in Platonic Dialogues, right, that Socrates is about showing that people who believe they're knowledgeable with respect to a certain thing actually aren't knowledgeable, and then obviously then you get the famous conclusion that the wisest man is the one who realizes he knows nothing. But insofar as these art experts are either ignorant about their subject in some way or are deficient in some way, to what extent is that critique of artists and their complicity in a kind of scam generalizable to other kinds of experts? We live in an age now, whether it's peculiar or more exaggerated in the UK, I don't really have a sense of, because I haven't lived in the States for 20 years, but the kind of anti-expert environment that we live in, to what extent is there criticism, almost dare I say it, and it was your example that made me think of it, of people like us who mm -hmm. claim to have pieces of paper saying that we're experts in A, B, and C, and that some of it is a kind of self-reinforcing thing that doesn't mm -hmm. actually mean anything. Who was it that said during the last election that we have to stand up for the experts? It was Michael Goat, yeah, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Yeah. That anti-intellectualism, not just in our country, but in a lot of countries, it has some purchase when some of these claims to expertise are just just the flashing of a piece of ID in a wallet by somebody whose job it is to guard a market. And I suppose the one thing we could point to is a clear difference between our sorts of expertise and art experts is that we are not guardians of a market. We don't have a vested interest in pretending to be an expert when we're not. We have every reason to admit in situations when we don't know that we don't know. That's the easy way mm. out. Yeah. We're the good experts. Well, I think for me, I've always thought of the PhD as like getting the driving license. It gives you license literally to do the thing. It doesn't make you an expert driver. <laughs> it doesn't even make you a good driver. <laughs> There's so many people out there who truly aren't experts in something, who don't have the bits of paper. And there are lots of people out there with bits of paper who know nothing. For me, it's I take Doctor of Philosophy quite literally. This is, I am like a pro at loving knowledge <laughs> and loving learning. So that's how I take it. So I don't claim to be an expert in anything. I just love learning stuff.
and I want other people to love learning stuff as well. <laughs> My memory's too bad to claim to be an expert in anything. I can't remember half the stuff I've done <laughs> in my life. If someone was looking for the expert on performance art in Northern Ireland That's over the me. last two decades... <laughs> I know would, bits and pieces, but would, not enough. Would you rank it in the top ten of such experts? Well, no, I, d I know exactly who to send you to. It's <laughs> <laughs> proper expertise. Knowing who knows more than you. I don't know if anybody else had any more they would want to say. I've got just a couple of things. I don't really know how to link them together. We don't particularly go for profound structures with these things. They yeah. just as they come. Um, we often do a moment where we just discuss stylistic tendencies. So we've been having a lot of Sophia Coppola recently. And yeah. we sit and we'll go, oh, really, really Look stark. Look at the pastels yeah. in that. <laughs> so, many, <laughs> so many contrasts between orange and blue and scene ending. So many gentle camera moves, handheld effects gentle swirly camera moves so we do bunches of that but we've touched on stylistic aspects of this film already okay. in rosebud the um david thompson biography he mentions the montage and the long takes and it's the mise en scene that carries it i was thinking actually there's the part where wells is talking through his past and he's in this park somewhere in france yeah, i think a, yeah. just the changing colors of the same scene evokes the year passing the seasons it um, does imply that over the course of a year he went to the same park, wearing the same costume on the same bench and got somebody to film him for about 10 seconds in each season and then edited those together to yeah, constitute that, that and, Yeah, I think there story. certainly were again, this is a, based on a vague memory of the DVD commentary. I think there were at least two visits and certainly when he talks about I forget exactly what it is, I, I think it's he mentions the word winter or whatever. That shot mm. is super blue. Yes, um, yes. It's one that really looks like it's been you know, it's got a filter on uh -huh. it or something. Yes. Which I think is interesting because then obviously in the very next shot it's more mm -hmm. like the previous one, mm -hmm. but still different, as mm -hmm. you say. Yeah. He's sort of telling his origin story as a faker during all of this as well. It's really nicely done. Though I thought that was an interesting point about the montages in the mise-en-scene. They're working together very yeah. much. When directors get associated with working using a specific tool in the toolkit and not using others, it's usually because we've very cursorily looked at their work because those directors who use lots of editing still nonetheless use movement within the frame and staging in depth in some places. Our Sophia Coppola observations have included early on going, wow, she never moves the camera. And then after about three films going, She's very judicious in her movements of the camera. You know, they she, are she does. There well, when it's you. Yeah, okay. He's doing yeah. that, and I'm pointing out to you. No, the other day you're saying how much the camera moves. Yeah. <laughs> you're okay. saying it never moves. <laughs> I associated initially associated Sophia Coppola with never moving the camera, and then suddenly I just went, oh, okay, that's just way too reductive. Well, one thing that I think I underlined several times was that some of the people being interviewed here claimed that Almir had never forged anything. So there was this claim that he was a fake forger. That was one of the many places in which this film was quite meta yeah. in which it was going if there's fakery going on it, it's him pretending to have ever sold a fake and him pretending that he's found his own fakes in galleries and in catalogues and being sold and I like that we're just going to add on level after level after yeah, level yeah. and there's a funny line. remark that Clifford Irving makes where he says actually that I've never known Elmir to be wrong in his identification mm. of a painting that he's forged I don't even understand what that claim means <laughs> or could mean yeah, right yeah, <laughs> Um, you know, because precisely if the Hall of Mirrors effect, how would we know? How would we possibly verify that claim? I just, you know, and he gives it with all of this sincerity as if this is the conclusive argument. I don't understand how it can make any sense for precisely the reason that you're talking about, the at least possibility that it is all one level further up, that it is all a fake. But one of the things that bugged me a little bit about that, and this comes up, I think, a bit more clearly, we didn't see it, but the nine-minute trailer that Wells put together oh, in 19. Right. 76 as the trailer for the film as if anybody was going to show a nine minute trailer or, you know, which of course the distributor didn't. To the extent that I feel like I should be worried about this and connecting it up with some of the things to do with the modern issues are partly around not so much fake news but more stuff around almost like teaching the controversy. So some of the things in the trailer are a bit more like where he's putting stuff together. What's the connection between this person and Howard Hughes and putting these various things together and essentially asking questions to which the answer is obviously no or <laughs> nothing but by asking the question it's like oh I'm not making any claims I'm just asking the question when you know that the answer is no that it has no relation this is not a question that we need to ask 
to what extent is that worrying stroke disingenuous? Because I think mm-hmm. partly right at that point, the Hall of Mirrors stops. You know, I think it is possible to think, is Dahori actually making all of this up and playing everyone? You can spin that out even further into questions that are just not remotely plausible. And I, say, I think a little of that comes up in the trailer. That kind of worries me a little bit about this. The one point where it feels to me almost like there's potentially a slightly sinister undercurrent here. And as I say, maybe that's just modern life and fake news and teach the controversy and the I'm just asking the question and thing. That was something that I felt was going to obviously come up was the whole current fake news obsession. We were talking a little bit earlier over dinner about a reality TV star being in the White House at the moment. What is the experience of watching this film in 2018? Because it's very different from watching it in the mid-1970s when it is brand new. And when I was reading the biography, Thompson mentions it very briefly, doesn't go into anything, but the timing of it, it's kind of right around the time or just before Watergate breaks. It will have been being made during and just after because right. Nixon resigned in August of 1974. Okay. And the story had been going on for two years plus, around two, two and a half years, I think. Mm-hmm. Is there something to be said about Is it a bit of fun? And yes, you can read it like that. Can you go deeper? Is there something? Is it tapping it? Even if it's not that sinister thing itself, is it reflecting on that more sinister thing? These greater powers that be having so much control and spreading so many deep lies are shaking society at its core at the moment. It's kind of mind-boggling how far and how deep it can go. It doesn't bear thinking about really. With everything that's broken recently about Facebook, Cambridge Analytica and... This is going to be a really nerdy connection. <laughs> you but say, there's... coming from you? <laughs> I had a little look at the H.G. Wells. Oh. Not Austin Wells, but H.G. Wells. Archive at the University of Texas at Austin. It's the Harry Ransom Research Centre. And one of the letters there, it's just about an eight-word letter. It just says, Dear Wells, W-E-L-L-E-S, comma, liked War of the Worlds, full stop, Wells, W-L-L-S, that's it. And so Orson Wells got this, you know, he gave it to someone and it ended up in this collection of letters by Wells in Austin. So, <laughs> the connection. H.G. Wells often claimed that he was a prophet. He claimed, oh yeah, I predict that. It doesn't really work that way. What he did was he would just have a look at developments and extrapolate them one or two years into the future in a way that you could very easily predict anyway. Or what he would do was he would provide a science fiction description of an existing technology and that science fiction description would be sufficiently vague and loose that people could come look back 30 years in the future and go oh yeah he was predicting TV in the 1890s or his idea actually inspired the thing that he later claimed to have self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. mm-hmm. so tanks for example he basically invented tanks he called them land iron clubs at the time if there was a Wells Wells W-E-L-L-S W-E-L-L-E-S affinity and there clearly was since Wells seemed to have loved the world of the world it could involve that bit in F of Fate where Wells refers to the world in which they live being computerised so it's 1975 mm-hmm, yeah. no one's on mobile phones no one's got personal computers when he talks about the world being computerised he's talking about computers used as administrative tools by governments and by businesses including you know computerised tra- Traffic systems. So it's computers doing managing jobs like that. So he's talking about this computerized world and he means it's computerized in the sense of it's sanitized, it's regimented, it's dehumanized. So he doesn't necessarily mean that it's invasive, that it's eroding away at our privacy, but it certainly has negative connotations anyway. He's already at that point going, okay, the ability to document in such detail the various circulations of capital and resources in our countries, that's something that computers are bringing about, and that's the thing that we're now living with, isn't it? So he was just witnessing a very small bud version of what is now fully flowering and controlling our lives. So, a little bit prophetic, I suppose, Mm -hmm. of what's happening now. Although I suppose what he doesn't seem to have prophesied is the idea that computerisation would enable misinformation, would enable the circulation of stuff that claimed to be information that wasn't. For him, computers are actually associated with completely reliable, unfalsifiable information. So, actually, I just completely disagree with myself. (laughs) No no prophesying at all from what I was there. Although actually that does kind of connect up to one of the other things in a modern context that I think is interesting about all of this implication-wise. And thinking about, they existed at the time obviously, but with computerization and with the ability of effectively perfect reproduction, the kind of societal and general emphasis on intellectual property. 
part of the whole collage element of it. I mean, obviously Wells had his source material that he not only had Reichenbach's approval to use, but obviously then collaborated with him thinking about this in connection with the idea of authorship and Mm -hmm. remuneration for authorship and authorship attribution being the basis of remuneration that you can kind of see in a way what Doerr is doing is almost creating a new work of art through sampling almost I mean it's not quite the same thing because obviously it's very derivative but where he's not copying an existing piece of work but is producing a new creative thing based on the elements that exist and then therefore profiting by them because he's able to pass them off as being in an authorship way having been done by thus and such a person thinking about whether or not what the implications how modern that felt to me in a way it's not as I say I think it's a little too strong to say that it's predicted anything in that sense but a lot of the arguments that have been going on since at least the late 80s about sampling and about the creation of derivative works using various bits and pieces which belong to somebody else and at what point where does authorship reside with respect to that and is it sort of like the point that Wells is making in the Chartres section um, which is I think the one bit we haven't really talked about that much Mm -hmm. you know and that issue of like does it matter whether or not, in terms of the value of something, the actual, kind of the value, capital V, does authorship really matter in that context? Mm. I was thinking as well about the nature of biography, and this could fit in with that as well, because by producing new works that could be passed as old works of somebody else's, how does that affect art history? How does that affect the telling of that person's self? And then what about autobiography as self-authorship do you change your own story do you change even if that person's still alive do you change how they can tell themselves what about wells as self-author because he talks quite a bit about himself in this he uses this as an opportunity to rewrite his own histories and reimagine his own histories he yeah, reimagines quite literally him. actually in the yeah. um, the war of the worlds excerpt uh-huh. broadcasts are they're different they're yes. not actually they are neither reproductions mm-hmm. covers as it were of the thing or mm-hmm. they're actually new bits that didn't exist in the, uh-huh. in the original mm-hmm. broadcast there's that reimagining of what the original citizen kane was going to be yeah. with joseph cotton yeah. saying oh i was going to be this character based on howard hughes but then mm. it became about her so obviously wells had to do it and how real and how fake is that so there's this self-authoring of the past yeah and there's, and there's a lovely kind of nod to that in the news on the march fake newsreel, yes. <laughs> which is, which is of course, the newsreel from Citizen Kane, yeah. and starts exactly the same way. Yes. So the, the Citizen Kane newsreel, death comes as it must to every man, and this one, yeah, <laughs> as it must come to every man, Howard Hughes had a ticker tape parade, or whatever, whatever, whatever it was supposed to be. I suppose at the point when Wells said, oh, the last 17 minutes has been completely made up, probably all of us are inclined to just go, oh, okay, right, so the last 17 minutes has a completely different status from what came before. But one of the things that that last 17 minutes included was a move from having people themselves talk about what they did to dramatising it either through the thing with still photos of Picasso with blinds in front of them to make it look like it was Picasso looking out of a window operating the blinds himself, and that intercut with... Footage of Oya walking up and down streets. It's a combination of that, and then a little later, Oya speaking the lines of Picasso, oh, Picasso yeah, yeah. and Wells speaking the lines of Oya's grandfather. So they were reenacting something that had never happened. Mm. Rather than dramatizing it, even using still photos, although there were some still photos intercut there. Rather than dramatizing Actually, those it, aren't, funny enough, again, those aren't, the photos of her grandfather, again, that's a memory from the mm. DVD commentary, actually aren't even still photos. It actually was film shot mm. that they decided actually not to use the moving mm. image and excerpted individual things and present them as if they're photographs. Nice. Um, well, it's not, it's not even, that's not even true when she says here are some of the last known photographs. That isn't true. It wasn't even shot as photographs. Mm-hmm. Well, there's an ontological question there, which is, given that a film strip is made up of many, many still photographs and that what you do when you print a still for a film in publicity is you just take one of those photographs and print it as a still photograph. Is a film, in addition to being a set of moving images, is it also several tens of thousands of still photographs that you could pick one or two from? All right, so there's quite a few different statuses of storytelling in this. Sometimes it's interviewing people and getting them to say what they said or what they did. Sometimes it's that newsreader who was seeing on a tiny mm. TV Yeah, it's screen. that who was actually the cinematographer, a sort oh, of camera right, operator. Right. That's not a real newsreader or anything. That was all stuff that he and Wells mm-hmm. just, you know, pickups that they just did. He had quite a piping voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, did, yeah. I did think that person never really Couldn't got a job as a reader. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then there was the reenactment of just having two people who aren't the people involved just speak the lines of the people involved. So there's quite a few different statuses of recreating or providing an account mm-hmm. of something. And I suppose that just piling on all those different sorts of providing an account of something was part of its very postmodern feel. There was the lunch as well, where Wells is in the middle of everybody yeah. telling the story, and then he's doing you with a waiter in the food. Yeah, that's great. Could you take that away, please, and bring me my <laughs> stick? That's great. <laughs> In the middle of telling this story, this big ramble. For somebody who grew up in Wisconsin and in New York State, he has a very English accent, don't you think? It sounds like a bit of an affectation. It's quite eclipsed. Is it a northwestern accent that you would normally get that quite clipped? I associate it with New England, which is northeast. Which is in the northeast. Yeah. It makes me think of Fraser, Kelsey Grammer, a little oh. bit as well. That quite clipped, anglified almost yeah. American accent that you get. But this is somebody who had travelled a lot. He travelled a lot. He spent a lot of time in Europe, in yeah. Britain, and Ireland. Yeah, and, I, and again, I can imagine having, as it were, lucked into the having been a stage actor effectively from 15, 15, 16, mm-hmm. and constantly needing mm-hmm. to do different accents and stuff like that, which he can do. I guess. I mean, I don't not knowing the accent super well. I'm not in a position to judge. But you know, for example, thinking of like Lady of Shanghai. Exactly. Are you supposed to be Irish? Yeah, supposed to be Irish. And I, I assume. <laughs> I assume because it sounds typically Irish that it's completely wrong. In that way, it the typically wrong. Irish accents are completely it's, wrong. It's pretty bad, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's an amazing oh. film, but his accent's really bad. But he did a huge amount of Shakespeare yeah. on stage. I think he adapted three plays for film. Yeah. He did Othello. Othello Macbeth, and, and I guess Chimes at Midnight, depending on how you want to count oh, that. Okay. Which is, in a way, actually a sort of collage as well, right? Mm. Because it's a film about Falstaff taking various Falstaff scenes from different Shakespeare plays mm. and putting them together to create the life of Falstaff effectively. So he's used to doing the English. Yeah, that, that kind uh-huh. of, yeah, that very the yeah, actory, you know, actory, yes, actory delivery, good. you know. He was seldom without a really chunky cigar in his mouth yes. when he was out in public <laughs> in this film. And that's one of the things that got me. In addition to the it's fine to just touch kids when people are out in public in this film, did you notice that Dory at one point he was walking down these steps in Ibiza and he patted that mm-hmm. passing kid on the head and then slapped him on his mm. bum. <laughs> Did I see that correctly? He seemed to slap It's entirely him. possible. Yeah. <laughs> he um, does that yeah. thing of, I know everybody. Yeah, exactly. This yeah. is my island. Yeah. And again, I, you know, certainly at that time, it might not have even entirely been untrue. It's not a huge place. And obviously much more so than perhaps in the modern Anglo-American world. You get very much the villages where everybody knows everybody else. And you don't know if it's the presence of the camera or it's his presence, but when he's trying to invite loads of people to his party stopping at every single person yeah. you think like, you can possibly know all of these people enough yeah. to bring them around to your house yeah. or these people clearly look like they just want to have their lunch there was a lot of people in quite a few of those shots in ambling through the streets of this sleepy village with this immaculately dressed <laughs> very foppishly I loved his belts um, yeah <laughs> really <laughs> chunky belts yeah. really high waisted belts ambling around through this place like he's from a different planet yeah. in addition to the it's fine to just touch kids thing smoking Everyone just smoking, constantly smoking in restaurants, smoking in each other's houses. It's not been long since the smoking ban, but because of that and because of the decade or two before that of it's gonna kill you, we have now got to the point where that feels a bit wrong. People smoking so constantly in public just feels wrong. One other thing, that very brief mention of Dory having a bodyguard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that guy from Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a guy who just read an article about him and then just decided he had to go to Ibiza and then became his bodyguard. Is that a code for lover? He didn't look like the bodyguard type, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't like wearing yeah. very loose. <laughs> Quite sweepy hair. Very well manicured young man. <laughs> yes. Maybe just more piling on of rumour and uncertainty on top yeah. of myth. So does anybody else have anything more they would like to talk about? Well, I very much plan to look up accounts of what people did in reaction to the the War of the Worlds phenomenon. Because you hear stories that people killed themselves and stuff, and then you hear other stories that that was total guff, so yeah. it's hard to know yeah. what to believe. So there's Wells saying that one woman came into a police station with her clothes mm. all roughed up and claimed that she'd been attacked been by attacked. several Martians. Uh-huh. And I want to know, is that something that Wells just made up, or that someone yeah. else made up and made it to him, or did yeah, it actually happen? It's not impossible. I do recall that the 
traditional, the kind of cliche about UFO sightings and abductions and stuff like that, that a lot of that actually really started, particularly in the 50s, when you start having these Earth versus the Flying Saucers, precisely the film <clears throat> which Wells uses in here in various bits and pieces to illustrate the, the War of the Worlds thing. It, it becomes a kind of enabling mechanism for people to project their various psychoses onto, you know, or something to kind of latch onto. I think certainly some of that panic was genuine, because again, although he does, when he's talking about it later, well, but you know, we told them there was a whole preamble about, hey, this is the Mercury Theater, and we're going to be dramatizing War of the Worlds today. He really doesn't. There are various places he could make it clear, and mm. just yeah. chooses not to. Mm-hmm. So there's, I think, a kind of cheekiness element to it. Okay, well, we'll just try to see how far we can push this line for fun. One last thing for me, again, reading Thompson's biography, he mentions that Wells had read Pauline Keel's very scathing essay of Wells called Revising Cain, yeah. and in that she declares him as a fraud. According to Thompson, Wells really embraced this. This freed him in a way. He actually took it really positively. It gave him freedom and license to declare, actually, I am a fraud and sort of own it and be proud of it. And he relishes making this film in which he presents himself as a fraudster, as a trickster, as a faker. This is often the story behind works that seem to be have a kind of standalone grandeur to them, is that they're like the second half of a... They're the part of a phone call on a mobile phone on a train that you hear. The other part is what someone's just said to the person. You know, it's a criticism that was made a couple of years beforehand. It's a work that challenged a group of filmmakers or writers to do a certain thing. And then they do that thing. And then the earlier challenge or the earlier provocation or criticism disappears from the record. It's a common story. But I like that approach, rather than going, no, fuck you, Pauline, I'm going to disagree in writing or in film form, to just go, yeah, Yeah. I'm owning that. His (laughs) abilities at fraud became his genius, they were his Mm. genius. Thank you so much, Jeff. That oh, was well, really no, I mean, uh, thank you guys for having me. Uh, it was great to be able to watch this and be able to really talk about it. Geek uh, Garden. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and, and, you know, just uh, I'm surprised. If, I'm, if anything survived, if I managed to say anything sensible at all, I'll be oh, amazed brilliant. just because it's, you know, I kind of watch this film and go, oh my God, this film is amazing. And just, <laughs> it become this kind of blathering mess of amazing, great, great, just amazing, <laughs> great, great. <laughs> <laughs> It's just nice then to be able to sit and tease a few things out and get a bit more sense of it because it's one of those, it just keeps revealing itself yeah. over time. How many eons did we record? Almost two hours. You can get that down to under an hour, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> that seems hard work. It's, yeah, oh yeah, I know. I mean, it, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I have every sympathy, especially, you know, trying to line stuff up and get it to where the rhythm is right, you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't come in too soon so it doesn't feel a bit choppy, you know, the, if it's the fakery thing, mm. of getting it to sound like it's a natural yeah. single piece of speech. As I say, I have every sympathy from doing all the collage stuff that I yeah. used to do that I was talking about where it's like, you know, okay, right, where do we want to overlay these samples? And if we want to have this sound like a response to this, exactly how much time do you have to leave so that it sounds like a conversation? I'm not really that technical. I take all the big silences out and all the <laughs> repetitions and things. I think we all have quite an instinct about how long is a good pause. And it's a very precise amount because yeah. something like a quarter of a second is too short, but a third of a second is fine. And then half a second is too it's long. Too long yeah, tiny yeah, little yeah, amounts of time, yeah. right? Making it. No, that was great. It was lovely to have you. <laughs> oh, no, as I say, thank you so much for having me. I'm honoured to, to have been uh, <laughs> thought worthy to come on and, oh, and talk absolutely. about this with you guys. That's exactly what I want to try to do with it, actually, is more of this kind of thing. So it's very welcome. You've been our first. Many thanks to Jeff for joining us and all of our listeners and supporters. I hope you enjoyed the discussion and got some ideas from it. You can find Jeff on Twitter as Happy Plunderer. I'm keen to have more guests on and if you're interested in trying to meet or recording over Skype to tell me about your interests or work in the broad area of audiovisual cultures, give me a shout on Twitter at PEA Blair or audiovisualcultures at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.